Hello and welcome back to Watching Brief for the week of the 9th of August 2021. Uh, I am joined today by my slightly depressed co-host, Mr Andy Brockman. Uh, good afternoon, Andy. Good afternoon. The sun's actually shining outside. It's beautiful here. But then the, if I'm slightly depressed, it's because I've been reading the background material about our first item. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, well, uh, climate change or not, uh, our watching brief does continue. And uh, this week we are here to, uh, as ever, examine the archaeological news of the week and present it here for you to discuss and augment below with your opinion and conversation. And uh, we're going to start this week's watching brief with... Uh, the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Changes report that was published by the UN uh, that makes for grim reading. And the reason why we're doing this is because climate is everything. Climate is the, is the context in this instance or in, in, in terms of our purview of, uh, of archaeological monuments and sites. It's our ability to visit them, our ability to study them, our ability to look, to look after them. Um, and, uh, and there's one particularly poignant uh, uh, story that really highlights that we are in a, a moment of change, a uh, change, moment of change that, that we haven't seen the likes of, well, in this instance, actually, uh, for the past uh, two and a half thousand years in this, in, in this particular story. But I'll come to that in a moment. Um, I suppose, first and foremost, uh, what are the broad strokes? I mean, you were just saying that the, that the summary alone of the IPCC report is 46 pages. Uh, but b b before we go on to talk about what archaeologists and uh, heritage sector people should be thinking about or could be thinking about when it comes to climate change, um, what 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 are the headlines? Well, uh, as you said, I mean, this is not something that's easy to reduce to headlines because no. um, uh, the, it, it's a science based report of it's thousands of pages of data-driven evidence and conclusions as i said as you just said the um the summary uh what's called the summary for policymakers is over 40 pages mm. um you know you compare that to the short paragraph you get as an abstract at the end of your average academic article uh mm. you know, we're dealing with a very very weighty very serious piece of work here mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um the the headline is basically um that the estimate is that there's around 12 years to keep global warming down to around uh, one and a half degrees mm. um, above uh, what, what uh, what's there what we have at the moment. Um, that is reckoned to be the maximum that the planet can take without significantly higher risks of drought, of floods. Um, extreme heat which you know in, in and of itself can be fatal for plants animals humans mm -hmm. and the economic consequences of that which could be you know poverty and drought and famine for potentially hundreds of millions of our fellow human beings yeah. um this, this is about as serious as it gets in international policy making um the uh the U the un uses language are like urgent unprecedented um but they say you know that with urgent action which they also argue is affordable and feasible that the damage can be kept to a minimum that the um people might have heard of the paris accords mm -hmm. um uh, which pledged to keep uh, temperatures down be uh, between uh, from rising between one and a half and two degrees see um they argue that that's done but it ha it, it requires urgent action within the next dozen years at most starting now effectively yeah. um we now uh, added to this well yeah exactly yeah. Uh, um and, and, and we add to this the um what the so-called cop 26 conference in glasgow which is being hosted by the uk government uh, which is coming up in the autumn mm. um, which is expected to come up with um uh, uh, concrete proposals mm -hmm. particularly for the most significant economic uh, powers you know uh, europe us russia china uh india the you know the, the, the most significantly it has to be said polluting powers the most significant uh, you know, th th this is one of those issues where it's industrialized societies that tend to put carbon into the atmosphere which is what is seen as the, the root cause of this um, but the worst consequences are being wreaked on 
perhaps the least industrialized, the most vulnerable societies, the ones that are still, um, the, you know, the ones that either are on the margins of the oceans and particularly the Pacific and Indian Ocean, mm. um, and also the um, you know, um, sub-Saharan Africa, countries that still rely a lot on subsistence agriculture, so on, which is very vulnerable to relatively small changes in in, in climate, relatively, you know, relatively less rain and relatively more heat and you can have it can be reaped in a very short period of time yeah well in that, and in that sense uh it, it's so multifaceted it's really hard to hold in your mm. head at once and this is but this is arguably one of the reasons why it seemingly no one really tries this is why they have hundreds and thousands of specialists working on all of this at the same time <laughs> yeah. um but things for example like uh, encroaching desert desertification uh, is 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 a very dangerous process in, in in certain parts of the world where it's it's extremely hard, if not impossible, to reverse uh, that that process uh, once it gets going. Um, uh, it, it, it's been described as a, a code red for humanity, something that we absolutely have to act on. And and I suppose just just to, from a sort of a historical perspective, something which I would mention is that often in these conversations, I, I have. You know, colleagues, uh, I've uh, and people who I who I have worked with uh, in the past, who um, you know, when it comes to issues, for example, surrounding things like recycling or, or you know, the end, what's called the end users oh. effect. That it, I've heard people say things like, "Well, why should I do anything when China is still insert yeah. overblown you know, statement yeah. when actually China's also doing a lot." To, to invest in green energy you know the, again it's a complex issue yeah, and the simple yeah. answer is you should do it uh first of all because it's the right thing to do for the species mm. uh, at this stage yeah. as i say code red for humanity but also secondly uh actually i mean i know, I know you're saying the worst polluters now are, are those countries that you listed but but the uk has a role to play in its historic uh founding nature of this problem, uh, certainly at the exacerbation of this problem. I mean, we can see in ice cores when the um, when the Roman uh, Empire started smelting lead, for example, on a on a massive scale. Um, but but the but but the British Industrial Revolution, something which which in other um, sectors uh, of of society and conversation, and for example in the um, uh, in the uh, um, the history and national curriculum, we're very proud of, is something that we also have to be aware of and take responsibility for we exported this globally uh, and and so in that sense this that's another reason why particularly british friends and colleagues should take respons a little bit of responsibility so so do what you can when you can and then that, that's that's more or less that's my little thing there that's also doesn't mean that, that we can do everything so for example we still have a van you know that is a that is a diesel vehicle we're thinking of ways to to mitigate that you know but it doesn't mean that you can change everything overnight, but what you can, when you can. But anyway, but 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 how how the, how can this relate more broadly then to uh, the archaeological sector? What what should and could and will the heritage sector have to take into account in the near future? I mean, one one thing that comes to mind is just the the out the, the so many of our monuments and and archaeological sites of interest are outdoors they are exposed to to the environment and presumably there's going to be matters um arising linked with erosion and preservation and 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 the stability of monuments uh, um, for example um uh on on the Scottish coast, we're seeing uh, an, an increased rate of erosion due to an increased ferocity, ferocity in seasonal storms, which are uh, eroding away uh, hitherto relatively stable middens and exposed uh, multi-layered yeah. archaeological sites uh, on on the islands. I mean, that, that's that's just one issue. The other thing that leaps off the, the this particular summary of um, possibilities. Uh, probabilities most of these are stated with what's called scientific high confidence um, is strong decline in glacier permafrost and snow cover extent and seasonal snow duration at high altitudes mm. um, and, and then these will be continuing again through that period and again that's stated with high confidence now we've already seen reports for example from Norway of the retreat of glaciers and the recovery of um, uh, European Iron Age artifacts mm -hmm. Uh, you know, pe people would be very familiar with you know, Otzi, uh, the, uh, who was found on the um, Italian, I think, it was the Italian-Austrian border, um, the, the so-called Iceman. Um, 
instances like that will become more common. Now, if you look at the resources that were thrown at one single incident like OTSI, then imagine multiply that by many, many more times and look at the resources that the archaeological world would need to throw at some unique archaeology that might be emerging. And is it capable of actually handling that amount of work? So the retreating context of archaeology in the context of previously stable cold environments and the need to recover that material before it's it's lost permanently ha having been exposed to a, a new environment the uh the the need to monitor things like in the southeast of england you were saying yesterday uh in the context of places like flag fen where changes in water levels changes in salinity acidity uh, oxygenation all these things that come about when this balance is altered will change the the the, the need to to either save archaeology in the con and also in the context of for example of storms as i've mentioned in scotland uh, in terms of you know uh, rescue archaeology but also it, it will put previously stable sites at risk of of erosion uh, or or otherwise being chemically um um chemically dissolved in some cases uh that, that that's one aspect the recovery of archaeology yeah. but the other one as well is is a big part of, of of our sector and that is the context in which this material is often seen and displayed uh in the, in the context of building and development projects surrounding in particular museums the the big attractive uh dare I say it's even slightly vain notion that we need to build in every case a new wing to a museum or a new entire interior to a building or we need to re reimagine the exterior of a building in order to recontextualize material in a museum is surely something that, that's not sustainable. Now I, I recognize that some older buildings are less um, less environmentally sound in so much as they do allow heat to it to escape uh, and and it's less, I suppose, uh, less um, of a headline grabber to say, well, we've installed lots of insulation in the local museum. Um, it's much more interesting to say, we've built a new museum that's got all this wonderful new green technology. Uh, that is a problem in so much as uh, the uh, architect uh, architects and uh, planning sector are, su are suggesting that we need to be rethinking how we reuse and repurpose as opposed to knock down and rebuild. Um, I mean, what else? Yeah, so we've got the recovery of archaeology, we've got the context of the of the display of archaeology. Is there is there a, an argument to be made in terms of the way that we do archaeology on an international scale? Things like conferences, for example. Um, is, is that something? You know, do we need to reconsider whether or not we actually need to fly to Switzerland to deliver that keynote speech on, uh, you know, on alpine archaeology, for example? That's a very good point. And there was already a move just on grounds of cost and the, the high cost of attending international conferences excludes probably more people than it includes. Mm. Um, particularly, you know, early career academics, people who haven't got a huge amount of disposable income mm. to spend, you know, a couple of hundred or seven, more than a couple of hundred quid on flights, um, more again on hotels. You know, mm. is that actually necessary? Yeah. Um, so that was already happening even before COVID, even before, you know, our, our new normal of, of life on Zoom and Skype and Teams. Mm. Um, those, uh, you know, these were essentially... Uh, th these are things that individual agency can have an effect on. Yes. Um, I think there's a more fundamental thing, though, that archaeologists need to look at. And you've alluded to it with the idea of with, with talking about construction. Um, there is a strong movement, certainly in UK architecture now, um, for uh, the retrofitting of buildings rather than the wholesale dimension redevelopment of buildings. Mm -hmm. Now, the reason for that is uh, in some figures which um, I'm, I'm quoting here from Joe Giddings, who's the campaigns director of the Architects Climate Action Network, uh, who pointed out on, on Twitter uh, in the wake of the report coming out. Um, this is a, a it's a graph of building sector carbon uh, dioxide emissions um, in new construction um, in uh, an estimate between 2015 and 2050. Um, and the estimate is that within that period, the CO2 emissions of new construction, 90% come in the building materials phase, the, the phase when the building is actually being 
built, the old buildings being demolished and the new buildings being built, mm. or even just the new buildings being built. 90% of the carbon emissions come within that short period. The actual operational life of the building is estimated to put into the atmosphere roughly 10% of the total CO2 that that building will emit. Right. Okay. Um, it, you know, that, that is a pretty damning figure. And I think archaeologists have to ask themselves, do we just sit back and let the construction sector and architects and governments take the lead? Or do we campaign by saying, we don't want to work on new builds where it's avoidable? Oh. That the ethical position will be not to work on a new build if that new build is avoidable, if that new build involves the destruction of an old building that's perfectly possible to repurpose. That's an interesting one. Um, and also it's going to result in very difficult conversations. For example, yeah. uh, here in, 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 in the northeast in Newcastle, uh, they're, they're still actually completing a construction of various new hospital wings that were built uh, on the footings of hospital buildings that were put in in the late 1800s so um uh, you know and it was really interesting for me watching them come down because you could see the cross section of these sort of victorian and uh, georgian um uh, uh hospital wings uh, you know, mm. from a distance but uh, the argument there was that the buildings couldn't be repurposed that they were unsatisfactory in terms of for example provision of space for hospital beds getting through doorways uh, installing lifts mm. Um, uh, modern standards when it comes to the provision of oxygen, for example, in the walls, electricity, uh, and once again, things like uh, insulation, etc. The, my understanding was that in that instance, the argument was made that there simply wasn't enough room in the building to make it as it should be, or as it could be. Uh, so so um, I, I suspect that, 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 that these conversations will have to be presumably part of the planning process, I guess, won't they, in the build-up yeah. to two new builds and and so archaeologists can be yeah. can be weighing up whether or not as you say that this this is actually an, a necessary structure it, it's interesting because you know on an archaeological time scale uh, this is this mm. is this is definitely going to be be viewable as well i mean people are talking oh, yeah. about, about this yeah. called uh, anthropocene according to this report the damage that we're doing will will already mm. uh, take take effect for centuries if not, uh, indeed, it says here, Abs if not ab 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 absolutely. We, we we are we are you know we are past the point of being able to turn back completely. Absolutely, yeah, mm. that's what the report says. Mm. Um, I'm not. I'm actually in this instance not going to try and find a positive, uh, because I think it's important that we all reflect upon the seriousness of this. Mm. So normally I would say, yeah. so anything good that we can take from this report, uh, and yeah. now a squirrel um water skiing no I'm, that's exactly what i'm not going to do but what i will do a cute cat sitting on your computer yeah but what we will do is we'll link to the yeah. summary of the ipcc report below along with various yeah. other useful resources mm. uh also um, that uh, twitter link as well with the um that interesting graph 90 percent at the beginning can i can i just make one more point as well yeah um which is very quickly uh, and, and people can you know please join the join the debate below the line because there there are probably few more crucial debates in the world now let alone the world of archaeology as to how we respond to cl the, the climate change emergency as it's being christened the code red as the un have called it and they don't you know they wouldn't use the, that kind of arguably inflammatory language lightly you know this is serious serious stuff about as serious as it gets mm -hmm. Um, and if you're a member of an organisation like CIFA, like FAME, Federation of Archaeo Archaeological Man Managers and Employers, like the Council for British Archaeology, um, historic, if you're a member of English Heritage, you know, make your voice known to the people in charge. Tell them that they need to respond to this stuff, that they need a corporate policy, that they need to work together with other people in the sector. Uh, I was quite, I'm not surprised, but I began, before we started recording, I went through the, um, the social media feeds of CIFA, the fame, uh, of the Council of British Archaeology, and the you know, leading representative bodies in the archaeological sector in England, or in, in the UK, I, 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 let alone, I haven't looked at Europe or the States, right? I've, I've, I've just 
rather parochially looked at what's happening in, in, in the UK. Mm -hmm. And none of them, but none of them mention the report or link to the report. There is a global statement on climate change that was released in 2020, mm -hmm. but there's been no response so far from any of those organisations to what the UN published this week. Okay. And, well, and, uh, uh, and I suppose I, I would just end on the note, uh, the rather poignant point that I, I referred to right at the beginning, um, and that is the, the news from um, Evia, the Evia fires in Greece, uh, that uh, an ancient... 2,500 year old olive tree uh, has uh, now been burned to the ground. It, it is no more. Um, 2,500 year old ancient olive tree on the island of Evia <clears throat> was destroyed today in ongoing wildfires consuming the region. The ancient tree was located in the olive grove of Robia and uh, was such an enduring symbol for, of the landscape that the ancient geographer and philosopher Strabo featured it in his writings. This thing has seen the rise and fall of the Roman Empire, uh, the, the the rise of the of the modern world as we know it. Um, one person even joked on Twitter the the um, <laughs> the popularization, um, abandonment, and repopularization of 70s fashion, and <laughs> um, and now has gone. The world is changing, and the the world that is changing is is the context of what we do. And so, as you say, those bodies probably should have an opinion on um, on climate change, in particular yeah. in response to this report. Not an opinion. Not an opinion. Action. Actionable policies. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, our, our second story of the week is uh, is a, a, a response to uh, an unfolding situation at a uh, UNESCO World Heritage Site, uh, the Lalibela. Um, uh, rock hewn churches in Ethiopia, um, which have always fascinated me. I did a video on this this site uh, quite a while ago now, actually. Um, uh, churches carved into the geology itself, buildings beautifully uh, rendered in what um, uh, in what the 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 the, the king uh, who who had the vision to make this place dubbed and has since been uh, also colloquially dubbed uh, the second Jerusalem. It was a true, true vision of, of attempting to create a religious center um, in the heart of the Ethiopian kingdom. Um, has been uh, seized, the town and and the monument um, that contains it, um, no, that, that is contained within it, but has been seized by uh, Tigrayan, Tigrayan fighters. Um, and uh, this is this has led to um, UNESCO issuing a statement of concern. Uh, UNESCO wishes to express its deep concern about reports on the expansion of the conflict uh, to the city of Lalibela, Ethiopia, which hosts the World Heritage Site of the Rock Hewn Churches. UNESCO calls for respect of all relevant obligations under international law in ensuring the protection of the outstanding uni universal value and legacy of this precious site by refraining from any act that may expose it to damage by taking all necessary precautions to prevent any attempts at looting pillaging uh, and destruction therefore i suppose of cultural properties located in the area um, this is of course an ongoing place of pilgrimage and devotion and has been um, uh, since the 13th century when this so-called new jerusalem was founded the, the, re the reason why I'm interested in just highlighting this, and we can give it a little bit of, of context in terms of the of the conflict as well, because uh, seemingly people are are, are misunderstanding this. Um, this is actually a direct response to. I'm not going to name the person, but someone on Archeosuit Facebook, who um, who said, "Oh, it's fine. It's okay. It's fine. They're Christian warriors. They're they, you know, they're, they're they're also Christians. Uh, it's a Christian site." It, nothing's going to happen. It's fine. It's not. It's not. It's not. It's not like you know. Um, it's not like what happened, for example, at Timbuktu uh, with um, uh, Islamic State. For example, is the implication, uh, and to which my my immediate response is, uh, well, Reformation, Civil War. You know, <laughs> the list goes on. You know, just because people share a, a particular religious religious outlook doesn't mean that that buildings and people don't suffer in these conflicts. Uh, and in this instance, the UNESCO report specifically mentions the risk of looting 
uh, because if you're fighting uh, a civil war, you can make all sorts of excuses and reasons to 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 loot a site and sell off those goods for the good of the cause. You know, this this yes, okay, we're, we're gonna we're gonna sell off this 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 uh, this relic now, but we'll get something even better once we win the glorious revolution in the name of our whatever you know uh, political cause or faith in so here. So, um, I suppose the real question is actually what is the risk to Lalabela? And uh, and and uh, is are, is UNESCO right to be concerned? Do we think? Uh, the short answer is obviously yes, because mm. um, what is at risk in any area of instability? And um, we've seen the uh, similar concerns expressed, for example, in the conflict in Yemen, mm. um, which is ongoing still, um, and we're seeing um, a slow motion catastrophe in Afghanistan almost certainly whereby the the people that bought you the destruction of the Bamiyan Buddhas and the museum and National Museum in Kabul and also gave rise to an, an, another um, looting uh, channel to the west and to western collectors um, are taking control of large parts of Afghanistan again that's the Taliban mm. um, and, the, the, and, and you know I, I, other 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 religions are available and also do this stuff as you've just co quite rightly pointed out there's a different religious tradition in ethiopia and in tigray which we're talking about mm -hmm. um and, and, and um you know if i just say that for example anybody that studies trafficked antiquities knows that for example illuminated uh, manuscripts from the medieval period in ethiopia gospels and that kind of thing are extremely collectible yeah. so um mm. you need to say no more there's a real irony here in that the current round of conflict has been started uh overseen by uh abi ahmed who is the prime minister of ethiopia mm. and as recently as 2019 won the nobel peace prize for uh ending one of the previous uh civil conflicts in the country and had arguably made a lot of political reforms. Mm. Um, unfortunately, the uh, people in Tigray, which is in the north of Ethiopia, um, felt that those reforms were centralizing government to Addis Ababa, uh, the capital, um, and leaving them out in, out in the cold. They argued that um, the elections the postponement of elections because of the coronavirus was illegal mm -hmm. and eff effectively um it the whole that whole com that whole political conflict has precipitated the current physical conflict and the problem is that the tigrayans have effectively run the ethiopian army out of town yeah the tigray um, people's liberation liberation front, front. exactly um, according to art news here uh, around 2000 2000 250,000 uh, people have fled the region since November. Yes. Um, after this conflict broke out. And it's getting more and more yeah. messy. Uh, Atreya have joined uh, the Prime Minister in the fight against the TPLF. Um, yes. And so. And that's, be and, and, that's be and that's because there's a long standing dispute between the province of Tigray in Ethiopia and Eritrea, which was a province of Ethiopia and became independent. Mm. Um, yeah, so th we we're dealing with. As, as in many of these cases, you know, as in, you know, in, in, in South Sudan, in, in, in Afghanistan, in Yemen, that we're dealing with long-standing issues of identity and political loyalty, and um, you know, that often, you know, often, often religion is 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 an aside here. People people sharing the same religion can still be opposed to each other because of oh my long-standing economic Sorry. and ethnic issues Sorry, northern ireland for goodness sake oh it's okay yes it's okay they're both christians it, 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 yeah. it'd be fine <laughs> it, it, absolutely and, and and in fact you're quite right to point out this is not an issue of you know countries in that part of the world or with those religions this is nothing to do with you know um the the the, 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 the western right-wing issue of you know everything that everything goes back to scary muslims you know this is nothing to do with that whatsoever mm -hmm. these are long-standing ethnic and political arguments within those those states those countries yeah. um often often post they're often post-colonial states um you know ethiopia was occupied by the italians 
um, in World War II. They were thrown out by the British and, 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 and people who are old like me will remember um, Emperor Haile Selassie, who was overthrown by a military coup. Right. Um, you know, so the, yeah, the, these are long-standing issues. They're, they're not simple. And I, I think, you know, wh while we have to be very cognizant of the threat to internationally important, these, these places of outstanding universal value, as UNESCO call them, we don't save the archaeology by saving the archaeology. We save the archaeology by helping promote political solutions, political and economic solutions to these disputes. And we promote that by understanding or trying yeah. to understand because i have to say you know we've done background reading on this but we're not mm. we know we're far i'm not going to about to parachute in <laughs> into ethiopia and, and absolutely fix not. that's not you know that's not no. yeah you know. but but at the no. very least uh this is not as simple as um as looking at the flat the religious flag that someone's holding and saying absolutely oh, oh, the not will be fine yeah not at all. Yeah, absolutely not. The, and, 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 but the, the really important thing, you know, is also what what, what people in you know, uh, in the political and economic West can do, want for a better word, um, is to be very aware of the dangers of looting and trafficking, and making sure that you know a, 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 an, an Ethiopian religious book that crops up in a London sale house. You know, having been the property of an anonymous Swiss collector since the 1960s, has its origin has its origin properly researched, and not, you know, and not just uh, have you know, have somebody you know, take somebody's word for the provenance. Yeah. So obviously, I'll have to be very careful for Mrs. Soup's Christmas present this year, won't I? <laughs> As if I could afford anything like that. But no, no, I see. <laughs> yes, yes. Sorry, that was a bad joke. No, no, yes, you're right. Yeah, right. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Need to keep an eye on this stuff. Um, thank you guys for watching. Hopefully, uh, we found a little bit of levity where we could this week. In so much as this has been, a, this, is a, this, is a, this is arguably one of the most, this is arguably the most serious issue when it comes to climate change that, that, that the species faces. It it probably just is probably even more important than nuclear questions of nuclear prolifer proliferation. Um, uh, and as we saw in the 1980s, the combination of political instability and climate can wreak disaster on places like Ethiopia. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, but nonetheless, hopefully this has been enjoyable. Please do comment below or comment the conversation as you ever do. And if there's anything that you wanted to take a look at next week or in the weeks to come, just uh, send us an email in the email that you can see below and we'll take a look at it. Until next time, guys, do take care. Thank you for watching. Bye-bye.